Hussein, Mulwin, Sangonan, Nida. Mulwin, good evening or good morning in whatever part of the world you call home and from where you may be joining us this evening. A warm welcome to all of you. Particular greetings this evening to Professor Nontanta Kumalo, Advocate Mayosi and members of the extended Mayosi and Kumalo family, Chancellor of the University of Cape Town, Dr. Precious Moloy Mutsepe, Chairperson of the Council, Mr. Babalo Awonyama, and members of the Council present and past, to the VC, Professor Mamokheti Pakeng, and members of the Executive, welcome, former office bearers, staff members of, the, of UCT, former VC, deans, and emeritus professor. Dr. Gail Andrews, who's here as the representative of the National Minister of Health, members of the provincial government in the Western Cape, Dr. Keith Clutie, the head of Department for Health, CEOs and other partners of ours in the care and education of the people of the Western Cape. Mr. Sizu M. Masana, chair of the Gongani Mayosi Foundation and members of the foundation, Ms. Diana Yak, chairperson of the UCT Alumni Association, and alumni from across the globe. Diana is also chair of the Malberger Foundation and represents donors on our council. To members of the World Health Organization, the Health Professionals Council of South Africa, the South African Medical Research Council, and the National Research Foundation are in, in the room at the moment. To colleagues from other universities and colleges across the country and from further afield across the, the globe. A special welcome to the community members from across the country and beyond. NGOs who have been interested as partners, both with UCT and in other organizations, who epitomize the, the values we celebrate tonight. And an especially warm welcome to colleagues from the faculty, from the university, both staff and students. And then I do want to welcome Professor George Mintz in a special way as he comes to deliver this lecture with us. There will be a more formal introduction. A little bit later. Memory is the weapon. This is the title of the award winning memoir of John Matera, the former gangster turned poet and activist. Matera grew up in the gang riddle township of Westbury, a township formed in the aftermath of the Sophia Town Force to move. His reflection on memory reminds us of our varied history, each of which has moments of pain and moments of celebration. But friends, tonight we epitomize memory and we make a promise to keep remembering. The UCT Council has elevated the annual Bongani Mayosi Memorial Lecture to a formal eponymous university lecture to which UCT, this community, permits annually to hold in perpetuity. This lecture then becomes a part of the recorded and practiced tradition of the university, but it also represents the university's aspiration of what it promises to be in pursuit of being a global African university, unleashing human potential for a just and fair society. So for generations to come, even when we have long joined the ancestors, the 28th of January, this day, Gongani's birthday, will be the day that the university will stop a while to recall the legacy of Professor Gongani Mayosi in the company of a distinguished invited guest. More importantly, the message of the guest will always be to assist Africa in the pursuit of the greater tomorrow. The first black African to take up the chair of medicine at UCT Professor Mayosi in his inaugural lecture reminded listeners of the African origins of medicine and the brilliance of Imhotep, the African physician and father of medicine. Mayosi's own vision of a pipeline of PhD scholars who he said would change the fortunes of clinical medicine in Africa for the next 100 years is continuing to be realized in the faculty's record number of 65 PhDs for graduating in the most recent science. Bongani himself had an unwavering commitment to promoting health equity and championing the intellectual capital of Africa. A central part of this was identifying the African agendas. 
He modeled a unique kind of empathetic and transformative leadership, having a tremendous gift for harnessing your potential, for inspiring, motivating, and mentoring. Professor Dolman, in last year's version of this lecture, spoke of Mayosi's generosity of spirit and how endearing and, and lasting this quality would be. And this spirit is in fact given body in the valuable work of the Bongani Mayosi Foundation. Established after the passing of Professor Mayosi, the foundation has already made a significant impact, supporting academic, research, and training programs. I wish to acknowledge Mr. Cesare Masana, who chairs the foundation and is amongst us in this lecture this evening. This year, they have provided financial support in excess of 2 million rand in support of the intercalated program of science in the medical degree here at UCT, a project that was original, originally started by Professor Mayosi. They have also established an annual prize recognizing final year medical students who have demonstrated the all-round capacity for academic achievement, emotional intelligence, and social accountability. This award is adjudged by the students themselves in the democratic process. But you will be seeing a message throughout this talk where the foundation invites you to send your memories of Professor Mayosi to their email at bunganimayosifoundation at gmail.com. Bunganimayosifoundation, one word. Tonight, colleagues, friends, family, as we celebrate African scholarship and reflect on the legacy of Bangani Mayosi, we recognize his contribution to the success of this faculty of health sciences nationally and globally. He is one of the giants upon whose shoulders this faculty stands. In a ranking which computes among its metrics, reputation, research, and impact, as well as the levels of international collaboration, US News has recently ranked our faculty in the top 10 globally for infectious disease. This ranking, in fact, plays itself out through many of our faculty who both at the jointly appointed clinical interface, as well as in research laboratory and community-based research sites have been part of the South African response to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. We have collaborated on international, national, provincial, and local platforms to respond to the challenges posed by the pandemic. I salute those colleagues now and their contribution to, to dealing with the pandemic. I also anticipate that we will continue to talk about vaccination until we've rolled it out effectively across the world. So colleagues, friends, family, welcome to this evening of memory. The next item will be a short video insert which will follow directly after my remarks. That insert includes an address by Mr. Susan Masala, chairperson of the Bongani Mayoshi Foundation, and a Mbongi, and then a reflection on the life and time of Professor Mayoshi. Professor Mpiko Ntsefe will then introduce the guest speaker. Professor Mensa will deliver his talk. And then the Vice Chancellor, Professor Pakeng, will make a few closing remarks and will close the evening with the facts. Thank you again for joining us tonight in the celebration of African policy. Please enjoy the next insight. Good day. My name is Siswe Masana. I'm the chairman of the Bongani Mayosi Foundation, which was established by his family to promote the legacy of Professor Bongani Mayosi, especially in those areas that he was very passionate about, which is education, clinical research, and public service. In its very short period of existence, the Bongani Mayosi Foundation, in partnership with various institutions, including UCT, has started on a number of programs. We're very privileged in 2020, January, to launch the UCT Bongani Mayosi Library Project and we continue to work with UCT in a number of areas, including creating spaces for undergrad as well as postgrad students to do their studies, their research, as well as interact with others. The second program which we're really interested in, which we've started at UCT, is the intercalated 
BSc Med Science as well as MBCHB Molecular Medicine Program. And this is quite an important intercalated program because what it does is it combines medicine and clinical medicine with research, which is something that Professor Bogani Mariosi was very passionate about. We are very thankful to Anglo Gold Ashante who have supported us financially to be able to continue with this program at UCT and we hope to be able to expand it to the other medical schools in South Africa, especially because we see a decline in research productivity in the country, especially in the area of medicine. The other program which we have started as the Bogani Mayose Foundation is to promote the pipeline of especially young people and students at schools who are pursuing mathematics and science. And in this regard, we're very pleased and honored to have started uh, with the Siafunda, the mathematics and science program, which was started at Masibambisane High School in Delft, in Cape Town, and we hope to be able to expand this. We all know and continue to see the digital divide that has expanded, especially during the period of lockdowns and COVID. Siafunda has been able to produce and develop a digital program, which is really ideal for underserviced schools uh, to promote the learning and teaching of mathematics and science. The last but not least program which we are involved in is the Bongani Mayosi Academic Prize. Bongani Mayosi was very passionate about academic excellence, but also about public service and mentorship. We're very pleased that we've just completed a very democratic process where at the eight medical schools, students, especially in the final year of MBCHB, chose those that demonstrated not only academic excellence, but also research as well as public service. And very shortly, we will be announcing those that were awarded this prize and it's going to continue and be rolled out at all the medical schools in South Africa. As I conclude, we are really honored to partner with UCT in this annual Bongani Mayosi Memorial Lecture, which again is about celebrating academia, it's about celebrating research and scholarly activity. And we look forward to a continued partnership with UCT in a number of areas. I thank you. Can 
Nogumilisi lako ngate ni fagali kwa tali ya fagala. Kenu pumu kala ngwa kalu nge la kala glom sito. Mfoka mayosi. Desite. Professor Bongani Muyosi, brilliant researcher, clinician, leader, friend and family man, was born in Mtata in the Eastern Cape on the 28th of January 1967 and died in Cape Town on the 27th of July 2018. His legacy is immeasurable and continues to inspire people across the University of Cape Town and way further afield. Professor Muyosi was the most inspiring and most visionary person I knew. Um, and he saw the world not as it was, but as it could be. Throughout his career, Professor Muyosi made immense contributions. He transformed the Department of Medicine at UCT to become the largest and leading medicine department on the African continent. He also made it more inclusive. He made uh, being an academic cool. So a lot of uh, young uh, trainees and black ones in particular who would have gone into private practice now saw somebody like them who was uh, an academic um, and they aspired to that. And we've seen a burgeoning of a number of uh, black trained uh, cardiologists um, and uh, other black specialists coming out of this department. As a researcher, he was a global leader in the field and a doyen of heart muscle disease on the African continent. A major thread of focus that ran through all of his work was uh, the commitment to contribute to a better understanding of cardiovascular disorders of the poor. Uh, and in that uh, body of work, he focused greatly on understanding heart failure, cardiomyopathies, HIV-associated heart disease, as well as uh, tuberculosis um, uh, involving uh, the outer membranes of the heart, or TB pericarditis as we call it. Professor Mayosi's discovery in 2017 of a new gene for arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy that causes sudden death in young people was recognized as one of the most important medical advances made by a South African scientific team since the first human heart transplant. Professor Mayosi also made a breakthrough in rheumatic heart disease. What he was able to do in rheumatic heart disease is put that back on the agenda. Through 10, 15 years of work, he uh, created a momentum with the help of others, but that ended up putting rheumatic heart disease front and center on the agenda of, the, of African organizations, um, World Health Organization, World Heart Federation, United Nations. Professor Moyosi published over 350 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters during his lifetime, while many more have been published since then. Many of his papers have been converted into policy and adopted by global organizations. He's also made important contributions to the strengthening of health systems in South Africa and other African countries. Professor Moyosi's impact on the institutions he led was far-reaching. Professor Moyosi won numerous awards and accolades, including the National Order of Mapungubwe Silver in 2009 and an A rating by the National Research Foundation. His colleagues and students have told of his legendary sense of commitment, even in times of armed conflict in African countries. Professor Moyosi is widely remembered for the positive effect he had on people everywhere. You know, it's kind of like, well, Bongani believes I can do this, so of course I can. You know, he had that impact. Again, it's amazing the number of people that you run into who have a very similar story. Professor Moyosi's colleagues say they'll carry his life lessons with them wherever they go. One of the classic ones is lift as you rise which you always talked about, um, but that's how we should deal with people every day, that 
whatever we do, we should do it for other people um, and do it in that kind of way. And that was what he did all the time. Molweni, greetings, Keludumerisa, all protocols observed. My name is Mpiko Nseche, I'm the pro I am the Mauberger Professor of Cardiology here at the University of Cape Town and proud mentee of the late Professor Mayosi. It truly is a great privilege and honor to introduce you to our guest speaker this evening, none other than Professor George A. Mensa, the current director or division director for the Center for Translational and Implementation Science at the world famous National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute in the United States and great friend of the University of Cape Town, where he has been a visiting professor of medicine since 2004. In introducing Professor Mensa to you, I thought it important to provide some context on not just what he is and what he does, but who he was to Professor Mayosi. Now, many years ago, Bongani gave me his curriculum vitae to pre in preparation for a grant submission we were about to make. Amongst the many things that struck me as I read in awe this 47 page ode to excellence was a section right at the end entitled referees. In the section, there were only three names. Two of the names were those of much older, more senior colleagues who I knew had mentored Bongani over many years. The third name and the one that really caught my attention was that of Professor George Mensa. Now, I had known George from his multiple visits to Cape Town over the years, but seeing this got me wondering. When you're Professor Mayosi, an A-rated scientist, a recipient of the Presidential Order of Mapung Gubwe in silver, one of a small handful of African fellows of the National Academy of Medicine in the US, all before the age of 50, Nohal, who and how do you select as a peer referee? Now, most of you will have read Professor Mensa's biography on the invitation for today's memorial lecture and will be fully aware of his outstanding credentials and standing. This son of African soil, of Ghanaian roots, is an academic giant in his own right. His trailblazing path through institutions like Harvard, Cornell, the Center for Disease Control, to his current position of director of one of the most important divisions at the National Institutes of Health in the US is full of impressive accomplishments and a collection of worthy accolades and honors. But were academic credentials and standing alone enough to earn him that much of Bongani's trust and respect, I wondered? So further probing on my part revealed that Professor Mayosi and Mensa first met in the late 90s at a cardiology symposium here in Cape Town. As the only two African invited speakers, they bonded over what can best be described as a feast of shared ideas, dreams, and aspirations of how to advance African clinical science and their enthusiastic determination to improve the health of the continent through African-led scholarship. Despite the distance, their mutual admiration and respect grew as they plotted and planned ways to realize their goals. It was also clear that their strong bond was signed and sealed during an intense 10 days on the shores of Lake Baringo in Kenya, where a select handful of rising academics from across the globe were invited to come together to contemplate the big issues in cardiovascular public health. The year was 2000. Now over subsequent years, the two worked tirelessly and in tandem, often working through the Pan-African Society of Africa and leveraging the platform and resources provided by the CDC and the American College of Cardiology to drive and promote research and education programs on high blood pressure and heart failure across the continent. It is also a little kept secret that Bongani actually came within a cat's whisper of persuading George to become UCT's Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences following the tenure of Professor Marion Jacobs. But that's a story for another day. <laughs> In recalling their very special friendship, mutual respect, and shared passion for uplifting and promoting African scholarship, Professor Nonsansa Kumalo, the late Professor Mayosi's wife, described George as Bongani's brother from another mother. It was clear that George was his intellectual soulmate and a person whose vision for Africa's path to liberation through scholarship resonated with his own, she said. So you will understand when I say that in order to do justice to this immensely important and auspicious occasion, I can think of few other more appropriately qualified people to give us 
what is likely to be a very unique perspective on African scholarship and the Mayosi le legacy. Welcome, Professor Mensa. The virtual floor is now yours. Greetings, everyone. And thank you very much, Professor Mpiko Nteke. I thank you. I'm really touched by your very generous introduction. As you know, support for African scholars, African science, and African scholarship has been a decades long passion. And I really appreciate your taking the time to mention some of the work that we've been able to accomplish. Our distinguished Vice Chancellor, Professor Mamoketi Pakain, Dean Professor Lionel Green Thompson, Professor Atlanta Kumalo, and the extended Mayosi Kumalo family, the leadership of the Mayosi Foundation uh, establishment, faculty, staff, fellows and students across UCT, invited dignitaries, all protocol observed. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor and a real privilege for me to be part of this occasion in celebration of African scholarship as part of the Bongani Mayosi legacy. And I want to begin by expressing my deepest appreciation uh, for this honor you've accorded me. I should begin by stating that I have no conflicts of interest uh, in this presentation. However, although I am from the NIH, it's also important for me to tell you that nothing I say here today should be construed as representing an official position of the NIH or the United States government. Bongani was my friend. Bongani was a professional colleague. But far more important than that, Bongani was indeed my younger brother from another mother. Uh, and um, perhaps also more importantly, my wiser younger brother. His tragic passing two and a half years ago ushered in a deep period of sadness, of darkness, of sorrow, and of grieving. It took a while, at least speaking for myself, to go through the morning, uh, and I thought I was done but receiving a message from another colleague last night just brought back the tears again. And I really wondered if I'll be able to go through, through this lecture without breaking down, but um, I've practiced. And I'll tell you, today is not a day to look at the sadness and the darkness. As US President John Kennedy said, we are here not to curse the darkness, we are here to light a candle and to view Bongani's smile, the life he led and the inspiration. So at least for me, I'm hoping also for all of you that today would be the beginning using his birthday as a real gift to us to celebrate his legacy. I cannot think of anything as important as what the university has done in establishing uh, this legacy. We are here to celebrate that legacy, the best in Africa, the best for Africa, and what Bongani always emphasized, the real impact of the research to promote and improve the health of Africa and around the world. But if we are going to be able to raise the bar for health, we must begin by supporting African scientists working on African soil, addressing African problems, because there are a lot of those problems. I, it was Dan Nkayana who said almost 10 or more years before 
uh, Tony Kirby's paper in the Lancet uh, where he was quoted, but he said it's only when a critical mass of African researchers working on African soil, addressing African issues, only then can the continent start addressing its many health problems. Bongani knew that, and he had been saying that all the time. At least in 2007, when he called for the proposal to train a thousand health science PhDs. Now you all know the rest of that story. It's really gratifying to see campaigns such as the Leading with Excellence campaign that's creating the next generation of black professors in medicine. I'm very delighted to see the work that's coming out of the UCT and this effort. And my colleague, Professor Ntobeko Ntusi, uh, for this wonderful photograph. I hope that the next time I see another photograph like this, it will be of you with several women, because we also have to emphasize and support and promote African women as part of that Leading with Excellence campaign. At the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, we take this very, very seriously. And I'm showing you the, these two images, courtesy of Dr. Peter Kilmars. Peter is the Deputy Director of the Fogarty International Center here at NIH. And as you see, as of the end of uh, the fiscal year uh, 2019, the last fiscal year, there are almost 1,700 active grants that NIH was supporting in Sub-Saharan Africa. South Africa does very well. Almost a quarter of the NIH support for Sub-Saharan Africa is to su South African scientists. Together with Uganda and Kenya, more than half of the support uh, is uh, in, in this setting. Obviously, as we develop more research capacity and training and expertise, we're hoping that we can continue this tradition of support for Sub-Saharan Africa. I'll show you just one more example that we are very, very proud of at the NIH. This is an African postdoctoral training initiative that supports 10 African postdoc fellows who come to NIH and spend two years with full support in NIH laboratories. And then at the end of the two years, go back to the African home institution with an additional two years of support. This is extremely important and something that the NIH director, Dr. Francis Collin himself, has been very, very proud of and has made sure that we have the NIH director's discretionary funding to support it in partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, and implemented by the African Academy of Sciences. The first cohort of this program arrived on campus in January, February 2019. The second cohort was a bit delayed because of COVID-19, understandable, and we are hoping and anticipating the third cohort uh, will be announced later this year. We are very, very proud of the diversity of the fellows. They are from at least nine different institutions in six African countries and include three women scientists. I hope that when Peter Kilmarks talks about this program two, three years from now, we have at least half of all the postdoctoral fellows being African women. This is important and we hope we can continue to support it. Now, we don't do this just for the sake of science or provide the support for research just for the sake of research. Ongani pointed this out very clearly. We do this because of the importance of addressing the myriad clinical problems that we have in Africa. A report that was published in 2012 out of the MRC uh, and the Burden of Disease Unit pointed out that at that time, the South Africans were dying slowly of chronic diseases caused by high blood pressure or hypertension, tobacco use or smoking, raised blood pressure of the huge challenge of diabetes, uh, unhealthy diet, all the other risk factors, including psychosocial stress, a very, very important part. 
These were the major drivers. In a landmark paper published in the Lancet, Professor Mayosi showed very, very convincingly that over the period of 1999 through 2006, the gradual and persistent rise of stroke, for example, or other ill-defined heart diseases, followed by ischemic heart disease or heart attack, all of these were rising. Here is the data for diabetes in the squares, also rising. And these trends were similar in men as they were in women. In another landmark paper, Professor Mayusi demonstrated that not only were these important trends, but in fact, in many instances, they reflected a reversal of the progress that had been made. For example, if you take the dramatic reductions in child mort mortality that we had seen around the period of 2000 uh, to early 2005, mid 2000, we then saw a significant drop and a reversal of that progress. In other areas, for example, in maternal health, maternal morbidity and mortality, no progress had been seen since 2009. And within HIV and AIDS and malaria and TB, there were other major, major challenges showing insufficient progress. Not only did he raise attention to this, but he also provided options of strategies that could be used to really make a difference. In this heat map from the paper I've taken from the Lancet Global Health published by Pile van Wyk, the huge importance of HIV AIDS in every province, of all the 10 provinces here as number one, out of the 10 leading causes of years of life lost. You can view this as a metric or a measure of premature mortality in, in South Africa. Of course, interpersonal violence is seen across all provinces, uh, and so is heart attacks, but especially stroke, or here shown as cerebrovascular disease, which is in the top five for almost every province with the exception of Limpopo, where it ranks as number six. These are the major clinical challenges and why we need to train to support and celebrate African scholars, African scholarship, African science, and the capacity to even do more so we can address these conditions. Back in 2012, Professor Mayusi and I made a very strong case for the reason why Africa could not go by the four by four strategy. At that time, the World Health Organization and the major health organizations emphasized the four major risk factors, cardiovascular diseases, primarily heart attack and stroke, diabetes, cancer, and the chronic lung diseases, together with the four major and the leading risk factors, tobacco, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, and the harmful use of alcohol. All of these were important, but with Bongani's help, we made the strong case that the Africa strategy had to be a five by five approach and not a four by four approach because of the importance of infectious ideologies uh, of chronic diseases, uh, the case of cervical cancer, in the case of rheumatic heart disease, as uh, Professor Mpiko in Teke just mentioned, uh, but also the importance of mental health. And the good news is, this five by five strategy was ad adopted. And in fact, mental health is seen just as important for, for the continent as heart disease and stroke and diabetes and cancer. An example of the emphasis that Bongani brought to what was important and more than that, how we needed to address it. It was a real pleasure when back in 2007, 2008, I convinced Bongani uh, and Karen Slua uh, at that time uh, to join the Global Burden of Disease effort. This is a major global uh, effort funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, headquartered out of the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation of the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, but through that effort, 
we did our best and elevated the cardiovascular expert panel. And it is a real pleasure that last year we published a comprehensive assessment this year published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, uh, the data for cardiovascular diseases. And I show you this to make four points. When you look at the trends of the number of deaths worldwide for heart disease and stroke, there is a steady drive, uh, drive in men and in women from 1990 through 2019 over that 30 year period. We have not conquered that war. When you look at the prevalence of the condition, certainly uh, in millions as uh, shown here from 1990 uh, through 2019, again, a similar increase. If you look at disability adjusted life years, you can view that as a combination of premature death as well as life lived with disability. Again, on a gradual persistent rise uh, and counting mortality for both men and women also going up. The point is cardiovascular diseases, principally ischemic heart disease and stroke, are important, uh, important in Sub-Saharan Africa as they are important, particularly in low and middle income countries where nearly two thirds of this morbidity and mortality happens. Population growth and aging plays an important role but so is the suboptimal control of the major risk factors. This map here shows the areas where significant progress hasn't been made. Light blues and greens uh, uh, is good news, but the deep reds show where there's a rise in the age standardized cardiovascular disease death rate. We've seen dramatic declines in age adjusted mortality rate in Western Europe. Uh, North America, Australia, New Zealand, but in many places now that progress has stalled. Uh, but in places shown in the red in parts of Africa, uh, in parts of Central America and South America, uh, in the Indian subcontinent in Central Asia, uh, these are major challenges for us. The picture is actually much worse when you look at uh, age standardized disability adjusted life years due to hypertension and hypertensive heart disease. And as you see, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in the yellows and reds uh, reflect substantial uh, challenges. The highest age standardized death rate or disability adjusted life years due to hypertensive heart disease are seen in Africa. Bongani talked about this 10 years ago. Uh, so. These are challenges that have not gone away. And if we are here to celebrate his legacy, we have to keep that in mind and work even harder in supporting African scientists working on African soil, addressing these African challenges. It's important to highlight for this celebration that African uh, researchers, particularly South Africa, have made remarkable major national and global contributions to HIV prevention and treatment. Along with international collaborators, the South has made pivotal contributions to biomedical prevention modalities. Uh, and a lot of this is based on the elegant work that's been done in South Africa. That's contributed markedly to improve survival in HIV uh, infected infants, in children, uh, in adults. I've taken this from the wonderful paper published by Professor Glenda Gray, uh, showing uh, the initial challenges that you see here, uh, but then uh, with a, a significant improvement uh, we've seen in the subsequent years. The, the full figure uh, is shown uh, in this uh, here, uh, showing for the different age groups, uh, those under age 15, uh, the improvements we've made for the uh, 15 to 59 uh, age group, uh, but certainly the, the challenges that we must address when it comes to those over the age 60 years. Uh, unnatural death here uh, is reflected in the HIV uh, related deaths. There are many lessons uh, that we can learn from the HIV epidemic, uh, in particular, the remarkable infra uh, infrastructure that South Africa has built for HIV prevention trials, uh, for vaccine trials, uh, for HIV surveillance. Uh, and these collectively have poised South Africa to rapidly pivot 
to the COVID-19 vaccine research, uh, including clinical trials. Now, it's, if you haven't read the paper by Tagali uh, and colleagues, uh, I strongly recommend that you take a look at it. It's a preprint uh, published in MedArchive. Uh, here of the 10 major university uh, researchers who contributed to this, eight are from South Africa. And I'm proud to say the University of Cape Town uh, is part of this effort. But it, it maps out that in a very elegant way, the evolution and the spread uh, of the new SARS-CoV-2 variant, which is uh, invariably being called the South African variant, uh, mapping uh, the evolution across the Eastern Cape, KwaZulu-Natal uh, and the Western Cape. Really elegant work, uh, really uh, deserving of the celebrations as we talk uh, today. There certainly is uh, no shortage of uh, creative and innovative ideas for scaling up Africa's development priorities. Uh, here, uh, seeing the innovations for scaling up uh, implementation uh, of Africa's development priorities uh, only as just one example of the remarkable uh, work. At the NIH, uh, we are really very, very proud uh, of the partnership uh, that has been built. I'm showing you here the example when Professor Mayusi uh, visited uh, with the, uh, the leadership, the directors and the deputy directors uh, within the Heart, Lung and Blood uh, Institute. I want to finish up with just uh, uh, six uh, concluding points. Uh, and, and the first is that this creation of the Bongani Mayusi Legacy Project is a very fitting tribute uh, to a man who dedicated his life to excellence uh, in patient care, to teaching and to research, to continued investment in African researchers and clinician scientists, and supporting them is critical to successfully tackling Africa's myriad health challenges. I've shown you that the rising burden of chronic diseases, especially cardiovascular diseases, heart disease and stroke, uh, and the related risk factors deserve attention, even as we focus on controlling uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. South African researchers have made major national and global contributions uh, to the HIV prevention, uh, to the treatment and research that deserves genuine celebration. Uh, there are many, many lessons that can be learned uh, from this experience. Uh, especially the relevance for successfully tackling uh, COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 research with one particular example that I shared with you earlier. So a celebration of African scientists today must also include uh, creating a vibrant research culture that supports tomorrow's uh, researchers to stay uh, and build successful careers here in Africa. I want to finish off by really acknowledging and thanking uh, the numerous uh, South African uh, giants uh, that uh, Bongani introduced uh, uh, to me, uh, in particular, uh, Professor Notlanta Kumalo, uh, Professor Mayusi's wife, um, uh, several of the South Africans, uh, all known to you. But I want to particularly mention uh, Dr. Roger Glass, uh, who at the NIH works very, very closely with Dr. Francis Collins. Uh, no one uh, is as passionate as they are uh, in support of science in Africa, in support of African scholars, and in support of African uh, scholarship. And I, I'm just delighted that I've had the opportunity to benefit from them and to learn from them, and I want to thank uh, all of them. So I would end up by saying thank you to the university, for establishing this wonderful opportunity and the legacy of uh, Professor Mayusi. And again, let's all remember, we are not here to curse darkness. We are here to light a candle uh, and to relive the life, the inspiration and the vibrant uh, legacy of uh, Professor Bongani Mayusi. Thank you very much for uh, having given me the opportunity to be part of this. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Mensah, for sharing with us your views of the interface between African excellence, scholarship, and insight into the health challenges that affect our continent. On behalf of UCT, I want to convey our gratitude for the active support provided by you personally and the National Institutes of Health for building a vibrant research culture in Africa, one that is founded upon African researchers who will build their careers on this continent. In this context, I want to acknowledge the significant financial support UCT has received from the National Institutes of Health over many years. Last year, for instance, that support totaled more than 480 million rand granted either directly or through sub-awards. The personal and professional insights that you have shared about the rise in non-communicable diseases in Africa and the lessons African researchers have provided into HIV that are now assisting COVID-19 research are an inspiration at this time when the world needs hopeful news about the pandemic. Last year, UCT was awarded 41 contracts for COVID-19 related research, in addition to our ongoing work in non-communicable diseases. We join you and the global research community in fighting, the health, fighting for the health and quality of, of life of people around the world, especially those in historically marginalized communities. I believe in the power of public lectures such as these to not only inform us about your work, but to light a flame in the hearts of young people who need a role model, someone who demonstrates the, the difference African excellence can make in this world. Professor Mayosi was one such person, and so are you, Professor Mensa. Young people of this continent and of African descent across the world look at people like yourself, just like they looked at Professor Mayosi, and you were the hope, not only because of the work you do, but because of who you are and what you represent. While UCT has set the institutional goal of nurturing young Africans into academic careers, and we have established different programs to assist this process, what often makes the material difference to a young person facing a career choice is examples of leadership they see in individuals like yourself people who have walked the path they are considering. Our young people need to know they can make a difference in the world, no matter what their background, their gender or sexual identity, their race or religion or what language they speak or how good their English is. One of Professor Mayosi's most remarkable legacies was his dedication to mentoring junior clinicians. He took a personal interest in each of his students. And in that way, his influence is continuing to grow. So thank you again, Professor Mensah, for allowing your influence to come into our lives tonight. The most appropriate person to give the inaugural uh, Bongani Mayosi lecture, you. Giving a lecture for your brother, named after your brother from another mother, as Professor Kumalu described you. Thank you for helping us light the candle, or even for reminding us why public lectures such as these are important, to light the candle. Professor Mayosi was your brother, your friend, but he was here for us at UCT. He worked beside us. He led us. He taught us and urged us to do our best. He did not just call for change, he was changed in his life and his work. He set an example for us. And so his impact will continue to be visible and it must continue to be visible in how we celebrate his life. And so when you keep saying this is about lighting the candle, that's the most appropriate way to describe what an engagement such as this on a life such as meiosis is about. I've said before, that Professor Mayosi represented black excellence, a living proof that black scholars can be the best in whatever they do. He was that message walking around us on campus. 
And when I say black excellence, it doesn't mean he wasn't a role model for people of all racial backgrounds. He was, but he was an affirmation for blackness. And that's very important. I want to thank the Mayosi family, more especially Professor um, Kumalo and the daughters for sharing Professor Mayosi's life with us. He didn't only belong to them. They know how much, how much time he invested, not only in his scholarship, but in human capital development, mentoring young people, not only at UCT, but all over. While Professor Mayosi is no longer with us physically, his, his effect on us remains, challenging and inspiring us to be better and do better. We are grateful to the Mayosi Foundation for their willingness to collaborate with us as UCT and immensely thankful to the Anglo Gold Ashanti for the generous funding. And I want to take this opportunity to also thank other participants in this evening's program. Thank you to each and everyone who's there joining us for this lecture that will happen every year on Professor Mayosi's birthday. Let me thank Associate Professor Lionel Green Thompson, the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences for hosting the lecture. Mr. Susan Masana, the Chair of the Bongani Mayosi Foundation for presenting the Bongani Mayosi Legacy video and for giving continued support or giving continued life to Professor Mayosi's passion and work. To our Imbongi, Nelisha Sambi, for setting the tone for tonight's celebration of Professor Mayosi's life and legacy. And Professor Mpi Konteke, the head and chair of cardiology at UCT and Kroteskir Hospital for introducing Professor Mensa. Finally, let me thank each and every one of you who joined us this evening and stayed on until this minute. I wish you a safe and healthy 2021. And I hope tonight's celebration will help you to it will help you dedicate this year to saving the world around you. Thank you so much and good night.